Hello, in this video I will be explaining the functions of the prefrontal cortex, which is responsible for many of our cognitive abilities. The prefrontal cortex is required for our analytical thinking or problem solving abilities, emotional control, intelligence, executive function, planning, a verbal communication, memory forming abilities, and to some extent our free will. The prefrontal cortex and planning. So what would happen if you remove only the prefrontal cortex from the frontal lobe of the brain? First, let us consider that the prefrontal cortex is interconnected with many areas throughout the brain including the sensory and motor areas and the posterior association cortices. Know that the posterior association areas or cortices is referring to the place located between the occipital, temporal, and paratial lobes. It links information from the primary and unimodal sensory areas and is important in perception and language. Although the prefrontal cortex is interconnected with many other parts of the brain, damage to the prefrontal cortex does not result in any immediately obvious impairments to cognition and intelligence but given that the prefrontal cortex is connected to many different parts of the brain a person would uh, expect a change to occur in the cognition if the prefrontal cortex is damaged and in studies of monkeys prefrontal uh, cortex uh, scientists didn't observe um, significant changes in behavior when scientists remove parts of the prefrontal cortex surface again no substantial behavioral change was observed when the entire left or right prefrontal cortex was surgically removed however it was it wasn't until both the left and the right prefrontal cortices were removed that a drastic change in the monkey's behavior was observed. The monkey without any prefrontal cortex left shows something called disinhibited stimulus bound behavior which is behavior that lacked goal or direction and understanding the context or condition behind an action or event. In other words, the monkeys would automatically perform a simple action in response to a stimulus, almost like a reflex. To illustrate what this means, these monkeys were taught to do a certain action according to a stimuli before their whole prefrontal cortex was removed. For example, how to open a door by its handle. And after the prefrontal cortices removed, the monkeys would still reach for a door handle if they saw one. However, the monkeys without the prefrontal cortices uh, would not open the door because it is a complex goal-oriented action that requires turning the handle and moving the door to open. The, this goes to show that the prefrontal cortex is required for planning and acting according to a plan. The monkeys without the prefrontal cortex could only do an action reflexively without knowing why they are doing it and what are the following actions required to do it. The prefrontal cortex and self-control. Humans with significant prefrontal impairment from both strokes or traumatic injuries can display similar disinhibited symptoms termed inappropriate utilization behaviors. Certain objects and settings can compel these individuals to perform the associated action without regard to the appropriateness of the context. Many fascinating anecdotal stories of these patients with damage to the prefrontal cortex are available. For example, one story recounts a patient who had worked in an executive position for numerous years prior to his stroke that affected his frontal lobe function. Now he would enter his doctor's office and unconsciously take a seat behind the desk in the doctor's chair. Uh, another patient, upon seeing a stapler, was compelled to staple together any loose paper that was sitting on the desk. Yet another patient saw a toothbrush and automatically picked it up to brush her teeth. When the doctor asked her why she was brushing her teeth, she said she simply didn't know. These anecdotes show that the prefrontal cortex is required for our judgment or our decision-making ability, whether to do something or not. Without the prefrontal cortex, a person no longer has the ability to say no. Instead, he or she would act habitually according to a stimuli. That's why one patient started brushing his teeth for no reason, because that is the habit of that person he or she learned. That is the action brushing that he or she associated with the object brush. Without the prefrontal cortex, the patient loses 
uses his ability to decide when or when not to perform an action, when or when not to brush their teeth. And perhaps the prefrontal cortex may hold the answer to why some people have a hard time quitting an addiction. In fact, many studies show that the prefrontal cortex plays a significant role in our ability to control an addiction. Quoting the study, Disruption of the prefrontal cortex in addiction underlies not only compulsive drug taking, but also accounts for the disadvantageous behaviors that are associated with addiction and the erosion of free will. So according to the review study, a person with damage to the prefrontal cortex is more likely to compulsively take drugs because we need the prefrontal cortex to function properly for our free will. We rely on the prefrontal cortex to overcome our primary instincts, desires and or addiction. Because the prefrontal cortex is related to our self-control, I speculate that damage or malfunction to the prefrontal cortex may lead to obsessive compulsive disorder or OCD. Given that the symptoms of OCD fits the fact that a person may perform an action compulsively, reflexively, or without self-control. Furthermore, it is observed that the prefrontal cortex damage also affects our emotional self-control leading to emotional lability and uh, volatile behaviors. Where emotional lability refers to patients who experience extreme mood swings that may quickly change from one emotion to another. These patients sometimes express emotions outwardly that aren't the same as their emotions on the inside. So the, for the prefrontal cortex damage, emotional lability in volatile behavior is specifically seen in orbital frontal lesions, such as the for the classic story of Phineas Gage. Although Phineas has survived having an iron tamping rod running through his face and into the brain's left frontal lobe, anecdotal stories of him in the following years described him to be impetuous and irritable, as well as socially inappropriate. Although in much later years, he was eventually able to lear relearn much of his lost interpersonal skills. I think this is because the other part of his frontal lobe was still intact. Prefrontal cortex and language processing. The prefrontal cortex plays a very important role in language, specifically the left inferior prefrontal cortex, especially the anterior and the inferior parts of the gyrus, is shown to be associated with semantic mental activities. That means this region of the brain experiences increased energy metabolism, in other words, an increase in blood flow, increase in glucose intake when a person performs mental operations related to semantics. In other words, the left prefrontal cortex is responsible for mental operations that involve understanding language meanings. The prefrontal cortex and semantics. So the question is, how did scientists learn that the, pref that the left prefrontal cortex is connected to language processing, specifically semantic functions? Well, researchers scanned the brains of human test subjects while they were performing semantic tasks and non-semantic tasks. The researchers compared the differences between the brain scans and found that the left prefrontal cortex turned on or activated, meaning increase in blood flow and glucose intake during the performance of a semantic task compared to a non-semantic task. Note that a semantic task entails the generation of words, verbs like tie, to a semantic cue, nouns like shoe, and the classifications of words or pictures into a specific category. A non-semantic task may be something along the lines of judging whether a word is in upper or lower cases, or if the first and last letters of word is ascending or in a descending order. For example, for the word car, this letter C is uh, comes before the letter R, and for the word zone, the letter Z comes after le the letter E. In terms of the alphabet, scientists have also found that people who are atypically right he brain hemisphere dominant in language experienced activation in the right prefrontal cortex for semantic tasks. In other words, semantic functions belong to the side of the brain uh, that is dominant for language processing and it is not necessarily bound to one side of the prefrontal cortex. It is just that the, that the norm for many people is to have the left prefrontal cortex to be dominant for semantic language processing. Another observation that the scientists have made is that novel semantic stimuli activates the left prefrontal cortex, leading to better explicit memory formation. That means performing a semantic task forms a memory for the person that can be actively recalled. Note that the explicit memory is a type of memory that requires conscious recall like facts, ideas, meanings, concepts, and places, etc. Repetition priming and the left prefrontal cortex activation. 
If you did a uh, semantic stimuli or repetition priming, deactivates the uh, prefrontal cortex, leading to the formation of implicit memory. Know that the implicit memory is the type of memory that is uh, remembered unconsciously, like tying your shoe or riding a bike. And it makes sense that the left prefrontal cortex is deactivated uh, with repeated uh, semantic stimuli, because at this point the brain can simply recall the memory related to the particular semantic stimuli, instead of processing the information to the left prefrontal cortex again. This means that the left prefrontal cortex is not needed as much when recalling a semantic memory versus processing a novel semantic stimuli that is not known by memory. To explain it in an example, let's say that the person is asked whether a word referred to is referred to concrete or an abstract entity. For example, a concrete entity would be a table and an abstract entity would be truth. So the first time the word, let's say pi, is asked about, the person will take a moment to judge that it is a concrete object. But if the same word is asked about again, and this would be the repeated semantic stimuli, then the person will give the same answer at a faster speed from memory without needing to rethink the answer. To summarize, the prefrontal cortex is responsible for tasks that require semantic information processing or the ability to understand the meaning behind language. This also means that the prefrontal cortex is associated with the formation of semantic memories. Given that the semantic memories are a type of information that is processed or obtained through the prefrontal cortex, the left prefrontal cortex is used for the interpretation of new meanings from the words, however it is used less for remembering a meaning previously uh, assigned to a word. It is hypothesized that the activation in the left inferior prefrontal cortex reflects a domain specific semantic working memory capacity that is invoked uh, more for semantic than non-semantic analysis regardless of the stimulus modality more for initial than for repeated semantic analysis of a word or picture more when a response must be selected from among many than few legitimate alternatives and that yields superior later explicit memory for experiences Taken altogether, the critical function of the prefrontal cortex appears to be related to the processes that help the performance of complex behaviors appropriate for the given context. If a human were to suddenly lose his or her entire prefrontal cortex, this person would survive but also be stimulus bound. This person would be unable to plan and execute complex multi-step actions and incapable of inhibiting inappropriate extreme behaviors. Plus, this person would no longer be able to verbally express him or herself with language and would have specific memory of processing defects. However, I suspect that the word comprehension should be mostly intact, although perhaps not grammar, since understanding word meanings relies more on the posterior brain regions. So thank you for listening. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask me in the comments below. I'd appreciate if you like and share this video and, and subscribe to my channel. Bye!